Well, hi everyone, this is Bob the Science Guy. You know, in order to understand motion, we need to understand the laws governing motion. Now, fortunately, these were worked out in the 17th century by Sir Isaac Newton, and they're best known as Newton's first, second, and third laws of motion. In this episode, I'm going to talk primarily about the first law of motion and its implications, and then we'll just take the other ones in turn. Now, Newton's first law of motion is very simple. It says that an object at rest will remain at rest, and an object in uniform motion will remain in uniform motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Now, that's a lot of words, but it's a simple and powerful concept to understand. Let's go see how it applies to something called free body diagrams. On my desk here, I have a multimeter. And this multimeter has a certain amount of mass, and as you can see, it's subject to the forces of gravity. So let's go ahead and draw a diagram representing the forces acting on this object right now. So we've got the center of mass of the object, and we have the force of gravity pulling it down, and that is the mass times gravity. Now, the table is actually pushing up on the multimeter to prevent it from going further down towards the center of the Earth. And these two forces are equal to each other. In other words, they're in balance, and as a result, the object's not moving. Now, if I apply a second force to it and attempt to move it like so, I have two more forces acting on it. One is the number of newtons that I'm pushing it with. And back here, we have the frictional forces. which is the resistance of the pad to me sliding it over. Now, if we want to look at this schematically, we simply draw a dot. We then draw a vector downward and label that the force of gravity. And it is opposed by an equally long vector in the opposite direction, which is the normal force acting on it. Then I pushed it with x number of newtons and frictional forces acted in the opposite direction, opposing this movement. So the net movement, as you can see, is zero because the normal force equals the gravitational force. The number of newtons that I push it with is greater than the frictional forces, and as a result, the multimeter moved across the pad. Now say instead of being flat on the table, my clipboard was propped up a little bit like so and it has at some sort of an angle, angle theta. How would we draw a free body diagram with this? Well, first of all, we have the vector of gravity going in that direction. Then we're going to have a normal force perpendicular to the surface going in that direction. The frictional forces will be in that direction, and the net movement will be in that direction. Now, how do we determine what these forces are? If we look at a block sitting on a surface uh, that is perpendicular to the ground, we all understand that there's a force going in this direction, and that is equaling a force going in that direction. This would normally be the force of gravity, and that would be the normal force. Well, that normal force is perpendicular to the surface. However, the force of gravity in an incline is not going in this direction. It's actually going in that direction, forming a right angle. Now notice right here that this is also a right angle. And we know that angle theta is this angle of the triangle. That's a right angle. So that means that this angle right here would be 90 minus angle theta. So to put some numbers on this so that we can visualize it, say that's 30 degrees, that would be 90 degrees, and this is 60 degrees here. Now notice that this is also a right angle. So if that's 60 degrees, that means that this part of the right angle is 30 degrees. 
So that's the geometry that we're dealing with. The final piece of the puzzle here is that we have to draw a line forming a 90 degree angle right there. Now, why are we adding this second triangle? Well, this enables us to figure out the forces on the block. The normal force is equivalent to that leg of the triangle right there, which is the cosine of 30 degrees. What's the hypotenuse? The hypotenuse is the mass of this block times the acceleration of gravity. So this is mass times gravity. So the magnitude of this force will be the cosine of 30 times the mass of gravity. What about this one right here? Well, that would be the sine of 30 times the mass times gravity. Now, why do we care about this? By measuring this vector right here, we get that vector. By measuring this vector, we get that vector. Recall that when we're looking at two different vectors, we can have a large vector connected to a small vector like this, or we can start with a small vector and add the large vector to it and end up in the same spot. That's why this leg of the triangle is exactly equal to that vector pulling down on the block. And the final vector that we have to add in here is the one opposing the motion of the block down the, the ramp, and that is the force of friction. Now, while that may seem like a lot of lines on paper, let's use some practical examples and see how they work out. So here's our first example. Say that we have a block of mass M that is being pulled with a 20 Newton force in this direction, which is positive X. What's the net force acting on the block? Well, obviously it's 20 Newtons because that's the only force involved. However, if we have five Newtons of friction acting in this direction, now let's add a little twist to the uh, situation. Let's put an angle in here. So now we're still pulling with the same 20 Newtons, but it's directed upward at approximately 30 degrees. What is the net force acting in this direction on the object? Well, the net force would be 20 Newtons times cosine 30, 30 degrees. And if you do the math on that, you'll find that that's 17.31 Newtons. But wait. There's more in this situation. What other force is acting on the box? That's right. We have an upward force acting on the box. So, what's that upward force equal? Well, that upward force is 20 Newtons times the sine of 30 degrees. Because this is the side that is determined by the sine. Remember, you're connected to the cosine you can see the sign from the angle. So the sign of 30 degrees is 0.5, so the up, net upward force is 10 newtons. Okay, what other force is opposing this? Well, the force of gravity is mass times gravity. Now, if the mass is two kilograms, what's mg going to be? It's going to be negative 9.8 times 2, and that's meters per second squared. So this is the mass in kilograms, and this is the acceleration of gravity, mass times gravity. So that means that we've got 16, oops, so that means that we've got 19.6 newtons of force in this direction, and that is opposed by 10 newtons of force directed in the, in the opposite direction. 10 newtons pulling it up is less than the 19.6 newtons pulling it down. So the net movement will be down. So why doesn't it go down? Well, there's another force acting on this as well, and that is the normal force exerted by the table. And that force is going to be 9.6 newtons.
So we have a total of 19.6 newtons coming up and 19.6 newtons going down. As a result, the mass will stay on the table. What if instead of being a 2 kilogram mass, our mass was only 1 kilogram? Let's go ahead and have a look and see what would happen with that. Okay, so now we have a 1 kilogram mass here. What is the downward force of gravity on a 1 kilogram mass? It's 9.8 newtons. That's 1 times 9.8 meters per second squared equals 9.8 newtons. Now, the upward force from our 20 newton force directed at a 30 degree angle is still 10 newtons. So now we're coming up 10 newtons. Notice that the force going up is 10 newtons, but the force pulling it back down is 9.8 newtons. As a result, the net force or the net movement will be in that direction. And the box will come off the table. Now in closing, let's put a few of these things together and see if we can analyze an object sliding down a ramp. Okay, so once again, we have a ramp that's at 30 degrees. We have a one kilogram mass. Let's go ahead and figure out the forces on the mass. So the mass is a kilogram, acceleration of gravity 9.8 meters per second squared, and the angle is 30 degrees. Well, the normal force is equal to this component of the gravity, which is the cosine of 30 times mass gravity. In other words, it's cosine 30 degrees times the mass of the block times the acceleration of gravity. Now what about this force moving it down the ramp? Well, that is the mass of the block times gravity times the sine of 30 degrees. In other words, that side of the triangle. The force pulling the block down the ramp is going to be this right here. And that's going to be 9.8 times 1 half, which is the sine of 30 degrees. In other words, 4.9 newtons. Now, will the block slide down the ramp or not? Well, that depends on whether or not we're counting friction. Now, if this is a frictionless surface, obviously, we'll slide down that ramp uh, in response to a force of 4.5 newtons. When we look at Newton's second law of motion, we'll be able to calculate that acceleration directly, and that's coming up. So until then, this is Bob the Science Guy. Thanks for stopping by. More to come.